they eat the Swiss. They eat the Swiss. I'm a member of the Italian Buffalo First Nations here in Port Patel. My Indian name is Satan Kanuni, based on a on a dream my mother had. A month, one month before she went to Spirit World, she had a dream and she called me home from over there to have a naming ceremony and a giveaway. I got my Indian name. Yeah, that was a long time ago. One month later she left us. In case it was meant to be before she left, I bet that name was going to fall into place. So I still carry it. I still carry that name proudly because that came from my mother's dream. How did our people live before treaties? I think for me, what I what little I know about our, our cultural background is they were nomadic. They, they had their own areas and they lived from place to place like that and they lived off the land. And uh, leadership was something that they had that was, uh, I think the old people had a very strong spiritual connection directly connected to the spirit, which is kind of stretched now. Huh? But back then I think they were much closer and I think that's where they got their direction from because they had the original astronomers, I guess, that watched the movement of the stars for direction down here, just like the schedule of calendar of events. So I think that's how, that's kind of how I visualize based on what little I've heard, which is meaningful. Okay. It's a good light, I think. Yeah. How were the leaders picked? Uh, I, I think in leadership there were spiritual leaders that were uh, that, that led through guidance and support, and I think they had a they had a system of uh, that kept them together. That were selected from uh, I think it was like a pie, yeah? and there were different uh, departments. I guess, if for lack of a better word, that everybody had uh, uh, a responsibility to keep balance in amongst the tribe. Yeah? But I, I think the leaders were selected by the people as a whole so that uh, before election time, before election, they would go to whomever they saw that had good leadership qualities, they would fill the pipe and they would go to offer to that person. And if he accepted, then he was acknowledged as a leader by the tribe, like that. And he was not, uh, he was, he served the people. There was no self-serving in it except to help the people. Eh? So that's kind of how, I, I, I understand that they function. And then the election thing came in and then now, now what? <laughs> yeah, that's as far as I'll come on. <laughs> yeah. What kind of qualities did a leader have to have? Courage, wisdom, fortitude, spiritual connection, balance, humility. I think that's what the people saw, looked collectively at towards a leader. I guess a lot of them had it, but I think some of them that were more, a little bit more directed by the creator eh, to the leadership role, because I think the creator was never out of the picture. I think that's where the direction came from, through the dreams, through the vision, through the, the, the wise ones, the medicine people that were acknowledging someone to lead them. Eh? We think of uh, leaders such as uh, Sitting Bull from the Lakota and Crazy Horse, those were guys that were strongly, very strongly spiritual. And they had, uh, uh, along with that, the good leadership qualities that I just mentioned. That. So there was a balance there, and that's how they led the people and other other uh, leaders like that too. So I think those are good uh, leadership. And I think today uh, people don't necessarily have to be an elected leader to be a leader. I think the power of example works well to anybody that is uh, spiritually, emotionally balanced. So when we have a sweat, we touch the, the water pail onto the rocks before the first round, and we ask for blessings for us and there to clear away our stuff that we can have something to share with others. Huh? And I think that's how leaders come in different variations other than those elected leaders or you know, there are other people that are good role models, I guess, today. Huh? The good leadership qualities they have, but they're not, except they're not elected. Yeah. They don't fly around, travel around, or go. <laughs> do, we, do you see traditional governance in communities today? There may be some, but it's hard for me to see. Personally, I, I, I think there's a starting to show itself again, like it used to one time. I think it was, uh, I think it was spiritually balanced at one time, and there may be yet, you know. But there's other. Contemporary issues and struggles, I think, that kind of 
are necessary to deal with today. Eh? So the spiritual part, I think this thing about reservations, reservation system and residential school has kind of made a gray area there that people are trying to work their way out, now, out of now eh? to, to put it back the way it used to be. So hopefully that'll, that will come in time. It'll be, it'll be so valuable. What were the changes that occurred with treaty signing that you um, seen or heard about? What kind of changes happened? Well, we're, I'm from the, the Canadian Sioux people and we've never officially signed a treaty with the government. So uh, technically we're considered treaty. Uh, in another sense, we're not included in treaty, some treaty or other. So there's a little, little uh, confusion there for me. But I think the treaty made, uh, made some changes that kind of brought restrictions eh? that was uh, kind of a, almost like a one-sided deal so that we were limited, like our, our, our freedom was limited to reservation system and all the rules that came with it, such as uh, permission to go to another reservation, permission to, to make a business deal with someone else, to sell a load of wood, to buy a horse, to do any trading like that was very limited and restricted at one time. Eh? And then I think it'll be interesting to explore the underlying reasons why those rules were in place towards uh, Native people like that. I've never heard a whole lot shared, but there may be some assumptions, but it'd be nice to clear it up and uh, people say, this is why those rules were in place. This is why you couldn't trade a horse or visit your friends on the other reservation. These are why those rules were put into place. So it'd be interesting to hear, to see. Yeah. How did people's lives change Oh man, you know I work in a I work in a in a I, I contract with Correction Service Canada and our institutions have a lot of Aboriginal people like lots eh? and young people and we have other areas in life such as uh, uh, poverty and people who are suffering from a uh, lack of education and I think there's something that displaced the spirit way back then that distorted our whole picture today so we sit the way we are. And, and just a while ago, we talked about uh, uh, polit politics and spirituality together balanced to help our leadership in our communities. And I think if we can backtrack a little bit and, uh, and review those, those things when, uh, when all that took place and so that uh, reservation system took away a lot of our stuff like that. So I think it, was, uh, it, it kind of, uh, it kind of took the wind out of our sails, I guess, as a people to try to keep that balance in place. And I believe some people say, well, uh, it's just like uh, turning a light switch. Just pull the switch and everything will be different. But it's not like that. There's a whole process, spiritual process of change and uh, social social changes, eh? social dynamics that took place that kind of rolled backwards a little bit. And I think what we're trying to do is roll them back over this way again. That's I think that's the process that's starting to show itself in it. Uh, I, I, I think it's so good that we have a, a lot more uh, Native people uh, educating themselves and and sharing that that awareness with other parts of society so that we all can understand. And I think that if the treaties were signed like that long ago, maybe it wouldn't be like this. But on the other hand, as a result of the treaties being signed and, and put into society the way they were, maybe there's some character building to be gained from that by Aboriginal, by all of us, I guess, huh? in particular Aboriginal people to rediscover our, our true natural selves, how things used to be before pre-contact and along the way up to today. Like that. I think there's a good review process in place that can make it a brighter picture. I hope, anyway. How did the role of women change? I think overall, there's so many women that are victimized, you know, you read the paper, you do the studies and you contact with the women's rights groups. And it's so sad to see the, 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 the things that are working against the ladies. And on the other hand, uh, there's, uh, there's so much women's, women's wellness movement to counteract that. And I think about, uh, you know, they, they say that uh, in, in a cultural sense, that uh, the guys that lead the ceremonies are not the actual true leaders. They are kind of like serving the ladies and the true power comes from the ladies because this, my friend one time told me about how he went to see a doctoring and this guy used to take these, uh, he had a necklace with that four empty rifle cartridges laced in there. 
And when he went to doctor people, he would take those cartridges and he would swallow them. And his doctoring, he would shoot them out onto the patient to help the patient. And this one time he said he was watching the ceremony where this old timer was doing the doctoring like that. And they had three of those cartridges. He managed to eject them out onto the patient, the doctor. They were sitting on the floor. And the fourth one, he had lots of trouble trying to bring it out. He had lots of difficulty. And the old kukum was sitting behind him. And uh, while he was struggling to bring the fourth one out, she was taking off her old black and white running suit, this friend was telling me. And as he was struggling, she just went, hit him right on the back like that, and the fourth one just came off. And he was telling me the real power is with the old lady, that she was supporting him, even though she didn't look like she was actively involved. And I, and I think like that about all of the, the ceremonies. We're just on our way to Sundance ceremony right now. And I think like that about the ladies, you know, because uh, when we remember our old grannies and the old people that, that encourage us, they were not loud like the, the male leadership. The male leadership did all the announcing and the loud noises. But I think the true power came from the ladies. Because in a, in a culture that I come from, and in many other cultures as well, the, the sacred pipe was brought from the spirit world by a lady. And when we go to Sundance, there's a young girl being groomed right now where we're going. And the very first ceremony of the, of the Sundance is our leader's going to walk out of the arbor and he's going to pray. And around the bush, this young girl who represents white buffalo cap woman is going to come with the pipe. She's going to bring it to the people and she's going to stand there for the duration of the four days. And when the sun dance is over, she's going to take the pipe and walk around a circle. Or she's going to leave the pipe and walk around a circle and go back from where she came from four days later. So she comes dressed in white and she leaves dressed in red because now she's had human contact. And she's our grandmother, white buffalo cap woman, but, you know. And it's so emotional when she leaves. People just cry openly and loud because of those four days of the Sundance. We experience rejuvenation. We experience uh, uh, identity, who we who we are, and to be proud of that in a humble way. What was given to us by the Creator, huh? and and the lady is a big, big, big part of that. So it's unfortunate that the ladies suffer as much as they do in our society today. That has changed so much, you know. But at the same time, there are ladies who are making a change, a difference again, and that's really hopeful to see. I have a granddaughter that just finished high school uh, about a month ago here, and she wants to send us, she'll be going to Sundance. So there's two things, there's the education, there's the cultural perspective coming together, you know, and there's a statue of the praying hands, like that, you ever see a statue of the praying hands? I believe that they hold something in there like that, you know, just like the bringing together of the pipe like that, and holding things. So I think the lady is such a big part of it. I never forget my granny and my mother like that. They were, they were so instrumental in all of our lives in our family. So that's 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 the changes that I've seen, both kind of hurtful changes and the recovery changes. And remembering before, like long ago, when things were pretty level, long ago people. Yeah. How did the people? make a livelihood before the trees, as in, how did they live off the land? As well before diabetes. Diabetes. <laughs> yeah, diabetes by itself has made such a big, big dent in our society. There's so many people, epidemic can that suffer from, from the changes. And I think about going to a residential school and the different foods that we were introduced to and forced to eat like that, you know, and. I think before that, when I was a kid, I remember having a, there were, we, we had no access to moose meat or, or elk back then, but there were a lot of deer, a lot of fish, a lot of rabbits, and a lot of uh, berries. And my mother, when we were very poor, could make an excellent meal out of vegetables, vegetable stew. We had, my mom could whip up a really good healthy meal from next to nothing, as well as probably other people, eh? But there were hard times along the way as well. There was, a, there was a kind of wedges of, a, of, a, of a cracking our culture apart. Away. There were outside influences that we were already trying to contend with and, and struggling to contend with. And eventually they broke, like for the wheels came off. For my, my family in particular, anyway, that I'm aware of, as well as others, eventually there was found fragmentation. Huh? Fragmentation and people left and people started to pass away and people started to suffer from malnutrition and coping with them, you know. I think people that are in recovery, some people in recovery will substitute uh, junk food or sugar for alcohol or smokes or cigarettes or food because we suffer from obesity and a, and a lot of 
you know, things like that, that uh, we try to cope with deep-seated issues. And without realizing it, we turn to food sometimes for comfort food. Eh? Smells good, tastes good, looks good, must be good. So let's have some. And pretty soon we're addicted and hooked into it. And pretty soon we're getting overweight. And the next thing you know, we have uh, health health issues, eh? which, is, which is, I think, uh, spiritually affecting us as well. I don't think it's just... Uh, the deep emotional uh, turmoil or, or trauma that we experience, but uh, the coping things that we, we try to use as well to keep ourselves afloat also kind of, how do you say that, compounded the, the problem, uh, added on to the, to the, to the underlying problems of, of survival, I guess. Uh. What kind of foods did they pick from the land? Uh, I remember we used to go, when I was living in Montana, we used to go pick wild turnips. We used to drive around the little hills and a little spade and say stop here. And I knew how to pick them back then and uh, there was different kind of berries. There was uh, dried meat, there was dried fish, smoked fish, like that. There was a lot of wild meat and very little. Uh, and all of a sudden we discovered, uh, just like in that movie Dances with Wolves, when that guy tasted sugar, how his face went. We were all looking like that all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't see what was coming behind, though. Now look at us today, and we really paid for it. Had we known then, had we had influence, had we had some kind of support to say this could cause you problems, but who was going to tell us that, you know, until we learned the hard way? So I think now the thing is to advocate for a healthy uh, lifestyle. I think we have healthcare professionals from Aboriginal communities that are trying to help us to get things back on track and. Some of it we can't undo, but we can prevent the other ones coming behind from like that, you know. So in my travels, I try to tell people that I, how I got, uh, became diabetic. When I changed my lifestyle and let the addiction to alcoholism go, I started uh, picking out Big Macs and lots, lots of sugar and lots of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and two packs of cigarettes a day for a while there. And I was 260 something pounds and I could barely breathe or tie my shoelaces. And I didn't realize, I, in, in the back of my mind, there was a little yellow flag going, but I thought, nah, you know what happened to me? And then I was done dancing one year and I, I, I stayed tied to the tree for a, a couple of days and I, I thought I was dying out there. It was maybe 106, 108 degrees. I thought it was the heat, but it was something else inside because I was craving. And this guy came and checked on me and he said, how are you doing? And I said, uh, I need a drink, I need a drink. His son dance and no food, no water. And he said, you you pray. Then he left and he was coming in the house and I see a little styrofoam cup. Oh good, he's bringing me something to drink. He brought a lot, tiny little bit of choke cherry juice, just enough to cover that styrofoam cup in the bottom. And he gave me enough. And I took it and I just threw it back, more and more like that. And he said, no, you pray, you pray. So I made it through the Sundance and when, when it was over, those guys told me, when you go back to Canada, you should go check there may be other problems. And reluctantly, I went kind of half thinking, you know, like there's, there is a problem. And I went for tests and it was like a death sentence when they phoned me and said, you're a diabetic. I had dreams about uh, IDEF, traditional, uh, traditional power dancer. I had dreams about from my knees down, I had artificial limbs with my outfit on that. It was terrifying at the beginning because I, I couldn't understand how to cope with it yet. And it was uh, almost like the end of the world for me. And other people I've spoken to as well have told me when they found out, discovered that, told that there were diabetes, that, that it was game over. But you know, what we have in place today helps us to uh, to cope with those problems like that. And, and a lot of it has stems from uh, improper nutrition for me. I, co I was coping with something else and I was using not the best thing to cope rather than doing a, a better food selection and eating the right foods I was I was adding to the problem without realizing it until too little too late. So I think all the information sessions that we have and we have uh, I've seen uh, pamphlets and stuff on uh, on good food selections eh, in different uh, different health departments to give information out there that's very helpful in, in, in helping us to make a selection. But this thing about it looks good, it smells good, it tastes good, so let's have some, it's a hard thing to break from because it's another addiction, I think, and it's a coping mechanism because there may be deep, there's some issues within that are still un, undealt with and we need to find another way to cope with them rather than to, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why people relapse and go back drugging or using, you know, recidivism, relapse. Yeah. So as a leader, 
he would have to deal with those kinds of issues from your own people. What kind of traditional teachings would help a leader? I think uh, I think the sweat lodge is starting to make a comeback. There's gray areas yet because we have underlying issues again that need to clear the way. If we can take our time and do it thoroughly and and carefully and honestly, then it'll come stronger. The creator will push a little bit more goodness. To it. But if we push too fast and grab something that we may not be ready for a, for and for us yet, then it kind of jumbles it up. It take a little bit longer, and we may have to go back and reload and start over again. But I think because we're desperate for goodness in life. We grasp at whatever, sometimes we grasp at whatever comes first and we hang on to it. We put a death grip on it because we've suffered for so long and that's all we've ever known. And it's the first light of hope comes like this. It may be a little bit gray yet. We just grab it and we hang on now like a drowning person. And it may not be quite in place yet. So we have to go really slow. And that's a hard thing to do because we've struggled. We've suffered. People suffered for a long time and they want out. And where's the doorway, you know? So I think that uh, those are some of the things that uh, maybe uh, leadership could learn a little bit more about themselves and lead us out like that. Because when I worked in a treatment center, one of the chiefs came to treatment to try to break trail for his people because they were reluctant to, to look at themselves, look at the addiction, and he was trying. So he role model for them. He came to treatment, and then they started to come. There were a number of people, leaders, that came in like that, which was a really good thing, you know? So... I think our, our, I don't know how to motivate or to suggest to leadership that they're our leaders and we count on them to help us, you know, like that. So not so much to tell us because it's nice to know something and tell other people what to do, but we always have to try to, our, our moxins have to be moving as our mouth moves, I think, sometimes. So it makes a difference, huh? Yeah. Thank you. What teachings will help leaders today? Uh, in, a, in a community that I'm from, we, I think, I'm guessing we have roughly 1,200 members of our band. And out of those 1,200, maybe 10 can speak our language fluently, if that. So out of all those people, the language has been lost. And I think the language is in harmony with nature. It's a connectedness from our spirit to our surroundings, our environment and everyday life. And I think if we can recover our language, I think it would make a difference. For me, I couldn't speak my language for a long, long time. I'm not 100% fluent at it, but I know enough to understand. And when I hear it, it, it makes the spirit move. It, the spirit, the sense of identity becomes, uh, it starts to move again. And then it starts to be, to know, to realize who I am. And to be proud of that person, it's not, you know, not bragging proud, but just to be humbly aware of my relationship to the creator through the language. Like that. So there's a connector there, I think. I just like that tobacco is connected like that. I think the language and the and the culture ceremony like that, if we knew those, it would kind of help to to turn things back in place. That's what that's what I believe in. And I hope for it really, because in my own personal life it's made a big, big difference. Huh? I'm, I'm so happy with the things that are in my life. There's things to deal with, you know, but at least if I didn't know what I know about the culture, the language, like that, the ceremonies, then I think life would be still kind of gloomy for me. So I, I'm assuming it's like that for all of us, if we could kind of get ourselves going like that. Huh? And, and I think sometimes I wonder if there's, a, if there's differences amongst, say, our people, if they have little personal, you know, little uh, sharp edges there. Those, those need to be kind of rounded out so they're not so sharp so that we can start to get along a little bit more and work together on the same page. And it used to be like that long ago when the old people, I was in a community where uh, the elder and the NADAP worker were having, we were having a talking circle and there was another elder that had been sober for a long, long time. And he was talking about, uh, you know, we have a nice shiny office here, he said, and we sit here and some of our people that are struggling with an addiction will come close to this building and they'll turn and they'll walk right by. They'll go past. They won't come in. For whatever their reasons. Us too, we know that when we were drinking, we had not very strong self-esteem. And he said, they'll come again. And long ago, we used to go visiting. We never locked our doors. We would go house to house and we would have tea and bannock and we would socialize. We don't do that no more. I might as well say it. He said, you and you. And he pointed at the elder and the NADAP worker. You guys know that too. Like you guys sit in your office and say, well, they can come here. They're afraid. 
we should be going out the way we used to and visit them. We don't have that no more. What's the reason for that? He said, so that was a, quite an interesting lesson. He was honest about what he felt, you know, and he didn't do it in a threatening way. He was supportive like that. So coming from a community member, and I think a large part, if our community members had a, more of a say, and I think that that that, that lack of, uh, and it's starting to grow, but however, those people who are still a little bit timid or afraid to speak out, there's a history to that that may not have to do with the presenting issue right now. It may be coming from someplace in their past where they've had struggles, you know, with courage, spiritual courage like that. And I think that's why if we could speak the language, because there have been two hearings where the elder and the offender speak the same language and they help the rest of the circle to understand the elder interprets for the people, you know, the other, the other people like that. So I, I, I'm pretty fine on this language thing. I'm, I want to learn more, you know, and other ceremonies as well. The role of the women, like the moon time, moon time, that, that's a very high interest thing for me because it involves sacredness and life, huh? and the ceremony like that, the, the high honor of the ladies like that. I, I don't know that we understand enough of that huh, to to make it because people get embarrassed or uncomfortable when the issue comes up. But when you really look at it closely, there's so special. Uh, I was in another hearing where a lady from another culture was sitting in a, in a sharing circle like that, and we were discussing uh, the moon time thing, the sacredness of moon time. And after break, she said, you know what, for me, where I grew up, there was nothing but shame involved in moon time. It was considered a bad thing. And I thought that's unfortunate. Like there's another, there's another perspective on something very special, you know, to life. So I don't know if I'm going off track or not here. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is these ceremonies are important for leaders, even for today. The we're, language, the right. traditions and yeah. the ceremonies. Yeah. Because you see, we're all equal. We have all of us have roles in life, just like that pie I described a little bit earlier. All the pie pieces of the pie are the same, they're equal. All of the tobacco things in here are equal. They're, they don't sit in here, they get out of here, we'll put you in here like that, and they're all equal. So in terms of leadership, and when we talked about leadership long ago, when people presented the pipe, that didn't put that one, elevate that one on a platform. But if he accepted it, he stayed equal to everybody and served everybody equally, not to dominate, manipulate, or, or anything like that, you know? Good leadership was very humble and honest. So I think I think knowing those things will help to make it uh, better. We need more talking circles like this or people socializing or to bring it back down to grassroots level the way it used to be like that. And I think there are bits and pieces from what I understand that are starting to be like that, you know, where people are starting to mix and mingle a little bit more. Yeah. How do you say chief in Dakota? Itrancha, we charge the Itrancha. I'm not quite sure what Itrancha means, but it's a leadership figure. It's a leadership figure. Yeah. I'm not, it's a leader. Yeah. Did it change after a treaty, that term? Uh, I think it's still, uh, it's still, it's still verbalized the same way, but technically and spiritually, it may have moved a little bit sideways. Because prior to election time, it was clear. It was clear, it was spiritual. And then after that, there came a competition thing, yeah? Started to happen. And then what else followed? Powwows and everything else, and little animosities in regards to maybe Almighty Dollar. I don't know. But it changed, you know, because I don't think our leadership was given a salary or anything back then. I think they were helped. Everybody was helped somehow. I don't think he had... A, extra, extra anything, I don't think. Maybe he did, because he used to say a, a, ball, a ball of twine or, or a box of shells <laughs> or a suit of clothes. <laughs> yeah. If the young people could be taught this, how do you think they should be taught? I wonder sometimes if the if the caregivers and guardians could be taught as well, so that when the child is taught, uh, wherever it be at a school or a sharing circle or whatever, that when he, when he, the student goes home, the child goes home, that the adults are there to complement and add on to what he's learned in school. Because there's a, I think there's a couple of generations that are still wounded 
And, and I think the more that, that we deal with our issues, the stronger that relationship will grow. It, it's kind of rolls this way, but it kind of rolls back a little bit and ahead again, you know, to to mend the, the whole process of change. Yeah. I think that I think that we need uh, adults because sometimes when adults are still struggling with uh, different issues and the child is gone to school to learn something, he comes home and the support may not be there and because of ongoing struggles like that, which is not saying people are bad on whether you're undeserving, you just struggles of life, you know, that are still need to be challenged, I guess. Yeah. How did the treaties, do you think, changed all of that with the Indian Act and how it changed the lives of people on reserves? I think there was, I think it like we said previously, I think it really brought a limit to what people could do in terms of freedom. Huh? Like that's why I said we touched the, the, the water onto the rocks. That's what we're asking for, that ability to for a free expression and not be uh, so restricted into how we could live, what we could say, what we could do or not do. And I think this thing about authority figures kind of snuck in there somehow. Because when we went to residential school, like my mother, I think, was only allowed to go up to grade six in residential school. There's a reason behind that as well that I've not heard expressed enough in different circles. There was, she was limited to grade six and she had to do something else. People had to go into the workforce or be a farm, work on a farm or something, but they couldn't go beyond grade six. And that has never been explained that I'm aware of why it was like that. So there were, there was, uh, when we talk about limitations, uh, there was a rule in place like that, I believe, that was not designed or even uh, consulted with Aboriginal people as to why they could only go so far, be educated so far. And I, and I wonder if the if the if the uh, if this dropout rate or something is kind of like uh, <clears throat> influenced by that experience somehow because the spirit is connected like this huh? from one generation to the next and what it's like um, a mother who's expecting who's pregnant who's drinking alcohol or smoking drugs or feeding the baby good the baby benefits from the mother's experience. And I think somehow the same happens from generation to generation in that we feel the ripple effects of what they experienced over there. Be it a good spiritual experience that was going good until there was a change in the whole thing that came with the, with the signing of the treaties. And, and that in itself was an experience because when people signed the treaties, uh, I don't know if it was explained clearly what was involved in that because you wonder if it's not one-sided by people who are educated, who have maybe a different agenda from the people that were believing and led to believe that it was going to be equal huh? or even. Because after the treaties were signed came those restrictions to reservation and residential school and eventual incarceration and all those other things that were not uh, discussed, I don't think, yeah? uh, consequences of our choices or like that, which were very limited, I think. Because if you're allowed to go to grade six, grade school, and that's it, like, where's that coming from? Why was it like that, you know? Or if you can't go and visit your friends in the next community there, those need to be un unraveled, I think, and addressed somehow. Right? So I don't know about this apology thing. There's a lot of uh, little loose ends sticking out all over like that, I think. And I'm not prejudiced or have anything against anybody. It's just not clear with me as far as I know, you know, understand? Yeah. It needs to be clarified some more, I think. If you could tell the young people who will be listening to this DVD, if you could tell them how to use these traditions and leadership qualities and skills into the future, what would you like to say to them? I was, uh, I was uh, looking at a little article and somebody shared with me uh, a while back that uh, there was a study done on Native American youth, three groups of Native American youth in the terms of, I think it was addictions. And the group that did the not so good were the group that were only in a contemporary world. And the group that was the middle group was made of those that are only following the traditional way, but the group that did the best were bicultural, multicultural. Eh? 
so that as much as we w want to succeed and we educate ourselves, I think we need to be grounded in our own traditional background. One of my friends came with me to Sundance one time from the Cree people. We were going to South Dakota for fasting and Sundance, and he said, before we leave, uh, on the way down, we're gonna stop, I'm gonna stop at my grandmother. So we passed through his community, and he went to visit his grandmother who gave him a lecture about grounded in our beliefs, what the Creator gave us. And she said, you go with your Sioux friend and you support him and you pray the way they pray over there, but you'll never let go of what the Creator gave us, our people as well. So you have two now. Well, what a good uh, lesson she shared with him, you know? That, and, and then he went to her for direction. He just didn't bypass her and said, okay, let's go. He said, I want to, I wish to see my grandmother on the way down. So we stopped and she gave him the little talk. She supported him, she supported me by being by culture in her own way, like that. And she was very strong in her, her beliefs, you know. Then when we went to Sundance, she came. She came to support us. And then when he finished his four year, his dad came and we they honored us. We were dancing around, and his dad was in the middle dancing and shouting like he's doing that Sundance. He was so proud of his son. That is a neat experience. I'll never forget those. Those are learning lessons in life, no? So I think if, as much as we we want to advance in a contemporary world, the other part of that is to stay grounded in our own world like that. And I think it makes a more of a rounded person. We have that much more to offer and to experience and to understand we're sensitive to the world in a wider scale, I think, you know, because our natural identity is active in all of that. So we can have the best of two worlds or how many worlds we wish to be involved in, I think. Like that. So, so I think that's a good thing for young people to learn to, you know, to, and, and, and who do we follow? Who is there to follow, you know? Like who are our role models? When, when I, I work for Corrections Canada and sometimes when a young men leave, they, they say, I don't know where to go to, to find a sweat. I don't know where to go for this. I don't know who to follow like that. So I, I believe it's like that across the board, not just the guys that are incarcerated. <clears throat> I think many of there may be, but hopefully there are people like, I don't know a lot of people in terms of the cultural sense. Yeah? So there may be some good, strong cultural people all over the place that I'm not aware of because my world is limited where I live. Like that. Where, but where I live, I see some, there's some good cultural support if needed, I think. Yeah. And I, me, I go to the, where my, the cultural people, like the, the Sioux people, the Lakota guy, because that's where my, was given to us not to ignore. And I go to all ceremonies, but for my own growth, I go to the Lakota people that give me lectures and kick my butt when they need to like that. <laughs> Are we done? Are we? Yeah. I was just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. There's so much, there's so much to discuss like this, you know? And sometimes I wonder if you had a few people in a in a in a little circle like this. Yeah. That they could more ideas could come out like this, you know? Yeah. Because we could feed off each other. Oh, I remember something else too, like that, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like that, because yeah. in, in recovery, we well, we asked people, would you guys be interested if we had a video yeah. camera? You know how rare Dakota elders are? <laughs> David, you're very rare. You know what, long ago I was going to university, and the teacher, after about 250 students in a room, yeah. and I was so timid, I just I was, coming, I was living in a halfway house yet, and I was trying to sneak out of the room, because I, I felt unworthy of being there and I didn't want to, but any direction I tried to be inconspicuous. And all these people, so I was in a bunch and I was walking and he would look and excuse me. He said, I said, oh heck, my university days are over. He's gonna kick me out. That's how I thought. He called me over and he said, uh, I've been watching you for a while and there's something I'd like to share with you. I was just bracing myself for the worst. He said, you know, when I was a younger guy, I used to ride with bikers. That's how I tried to make my statement in life. And there was still incompleteness inside. And I reviewed my life, he said, and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna to go to school. So I went back to school, now I teach. I make a much stronger statement. And he said, if you ever decide that you wanted to do something, man, you've got so much to offer. Here's a guy I don't even know. I gotta go, I gotta go. <laughs> and then that kind of followed me because I said, what does he see? Like, what is, like doing what? And the last time I went to Black Hills, I was talking to my friend Charles Pastor. I said there was a couple of our ladies sitting there. And he was sitting on the couch and I was sitting here with a night lap here. And then he turned to me slowly and he said, my friend, why aren't you doing it? 
I said, doing what? You know. He said, don't tell me. You know what you're supposed to be doing. And he told me in Lakota, they, they, they know, have something for you to do, and why are you not doing it? And I started to cry, and I said, boy, I feel so mixed up inside yet because in my last episode of Drunk, I was, I was charged with taking another guy's life. And I had a very hard time to overcome that. I went to the Sundance Tree a number of times, and I don't know if that's still a little shadow in my life, you know? I've been uh, clear of that almost 30 years ago now. And, but still, sometimes I wonder, and I need to clear that up. So that's why I try to keep in contact with those guys to help me, encourage me, rejuvenate me, and tell me I'm okay. And, and I sabotage some things sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, from the from the progress I've made from the, my last time I drank up to today, this day and night. Like this, sitting like this. The last time I sat like this was a police there, and I had a number of cops. One of these years. <laughs> I got that someplace in my wallet too yet. I still keep that because they say never forget where you came from. 